Okay, so in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7, uh, the, the context of this is we've been already seeing David um, consolidating things in Jerusalem. And uh, he now has uh, a united kingdom. And so he's, he's reached a, a stage uh, in, in his ruling where the nation is behind him. And that is a, kind of a new thing for him. He's, he's used to either being on the run or being uh, um, constantly having to watch his six for Saul. Uh, or uh, the divided kingdom where he's ruling in Hebron over one portion of the nation and the other portion he's at civil war with. And so now um, <clears throat> he's been uh, given peace. And if you go back to chapter 5, um, it, it talks about when, when he gets to the city of David and he begins to build there, uh, and uh, Hiram, king of Tyre, sends and offers to build him a house with cedar trees uh, and sends even the carpenters to do it. That's when David realizes God has established my kingdom. He's established my house. So. In chapter 6, with that establishment, he brings the ark to Jerusalem. Um, the chronology of this section is probably not, you know, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4 all comes in chronological order. It's probably a little bit grouped together here, here because after, after this section that we cover where chapter 6 and chapter 7 uh, really focus on building of the temple or his, his desire to build it, uh, we'll go into chapter 8 and we'll look at these victories of war. And it seems like it's likely at least some of those victories happen before these events where he sits down and goes, God has built me a house, I should build one for him. So it seems more likely that what the historians are doing here is grouping things together uh, topically. And so topically what has happened is, David has, is now established in Jerusalem, and he has brought the ark uh, to the city um, so that now it is, a, it is in the location that he eventually would like uh, to have that temple built. And in chapter 7, it begins with saying, it came about when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest on every side from all his enemies, which is why I say the chronology is probably non-exact chapter order, because chapter 8, we'll go back and look at all these wars. Well, chapter 7 starts with, he has rest on every side. Um, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, see now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within tent curtains. And Nathan said to the king, D go do all that is in your mind, for the Lord is with you. And we talked about this a little bit last week. Um, prophets are people too. Um, Nathan is an advisor to the king. He is also a prophet. But not every word that comes out of Nathan's mouth is prophecy. Uh, and so when David says, I would really like to build a permanent house for God, it seems strange to me that I get a, a, a nice house to live in and the ark is in this, uh, uh, this tent that's meant for movement all around and, and uh, a nomadic lifestyle. Nathan's first response is just, that seems great. Go and do everything that's in your heart. And Probably from an advisor standpoint, that all makes sense. David has the best of intentions and, and, uh, and peace on every side, and it sure seems like a good thing. And so Nathan tells him, that, that'd be great. That very night, though, God comes to Nathan, and Nathan takes off his advisor hat and puts on his prophet hat and has to go back to David and say, um, yeah, that thing that I said you should do, don't do that, um, because you actually are not. Uh, not the guy to do it. Um, but from there, we will get one of the most important sections of prophecy in all of the stories of the king. Because up until this point, um, the messianic promises all trace back to Abraham. And so everybody says the Messiah will be of the lineage of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And then after that, it kind of stops. Now, you and I can look back and say there's probably one more prophecy in there, but I suspect many of them were missing it, which is he would come from specifically the tribe of Judah. But the only really clear ones are the Abraham and the Isaac and the Jacob. But now, in chapter 7, we're going to get the establishment of the house of David. 
that the mess, uh, messianic promises will not only be through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but they will specifically continue through the lineage of David. Um, this is a, a model of the old city at the time of, of David, and this is where his palace would have been. Um, you, the city of Jerusalem now is much larger than it was back in David's day, and it was even much larger during Jesus' day than it was in David's day. So uh, Jerusalem as a city grew and grew and grew and grew as, as time goes on. Um, what is typically kind of considered the area of Jerusalem now, if you were to go to Jerusalem now, the area that would be associated more with David would be what they would call the old city. And um, this, this map, I, I have two parts circled just so you can kind of see the topography of it a little bit. The, the blue circle down below is that palace. So if, you're, if you go back to this model, that palace uh, is circled in blue in this larger one. And down below it are all houses and residences and, and, and marketplaces and all that sort of thing. Up above it with that red circle um, is the Temple Mount where eventually the temple itself will be built. So several different things to kind of note about that as David is talking about the idea of building a temple is that where the temple will eventually be built isn't actually even part of the city yet. It's not within the city walls. They're going to have to expand the city to incorporate a space for the temple itself to exist. The other thing is, is that when you look at David's palace, that blue circle up there, it the, the city kind of tears down, and so the palace is here and the city tears down. When David was on his rooftop, what is it that he's going to see that's going to get him in trouble? He's going to see a woman bathing on her rooftop. Well, how does that work? His house is taller than everybody else's house. Most other people would not have had that opportunity to see that, but David's palace is situated in a in a position where uh, she would have been visible. Uh, something to think about uh, when, when we think about Bathsheba is that I, I suspect Bathsheba didn't have any expectation of being seen where she was. Uh, that, that this is purely David from his vantage point of the palace that he was in. Um, but with all of that in mind, this is, this is the city at the time. As the, by the time you get to Jesus' time period, this will be four or five times larger. The city gets much bigger as time goes on, which means more buildings, but also more wall, right? There has to be an expansion of walls and things like that uh, as well. Um, just zooming in a little closer, you can kind of see up top there is, there's where David's palace would be, which is somewhat of a new archaeological find, which is kind of an exciting thing, too. Um, in, in the last decade or so, um, they've really uh, gotten a lot more information about David's palace. Um, but uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, there will be this prophecy that uh, Nathan will give. And so um, if you go down to verse 5, go and say to my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one who should build me a house to dwell in? For I've not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt, even to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent, even in a tabernacle. Wherever I have gone with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? So one, the first thing he tells David is, it is not like I've been pining for this. Right? So, so your desire to do something for me does not necessarily mean I have a desire for it. Which is an important just overall concept for us to understand as Christians. Because oftentimes, a lot of religious innovation is based off of, we have some great idea that we think, hey, if we did this, God would really like it. And I suspect that there's a lot of things that uh, in the religious world we have added and changed and adapted for the culture and the time because we thought it was a great idea. But if you were to ask God, he would say, did I ever ask for that? It's just a, it's a good principle for us to keep in mind just because we think God would want that doesn't necessarily mean God would want it. David is living in a physical house and he goes, you know, this is a lot better than a tent. So bad that I've got a house and God's living in a tent. 
Well, is that God saying that, or is that David just having a feeling? Right? That's, that's just David imposing his own feelings on God, and, and those two are not the same thing. So it's just important for us to understand that to start with. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There, there, the difference, God living in the tabernacle is a lot different than me living in a tent, right? Like, with, with, with him, the earth is his footstool. And Solomon, when he does actually build the temple, will make that point. He'll say, there's no building we could build that you could actually could fit all of your glory within. It's just for us to understand, and when we pray, would you listen to us as we face this place? And, and when we come and make sacrifices, will you, will you see those and, and find joy in it? But you're right. I mean, it's, God's not actually, you know, he's, he's not pulling out a cot and, and sit there in the tabernacle. So, um, so that, that's important for us to understand, too, that there's a lot of times there's things that we associate with humanity that are not God issues. Um, uh, anything else with that idea of, uh, of him making that statement to David right off the bat? Yeah, so David's intentions are great, though, right? And that's a very positive thing, and God factors that in. And that's, I think, also important for us to understand that David is incorrect in God's need for this or that somehow it's shameful for God to dwell in a tabernacle, but God recognizes that David, this comes from a place of David saying, God has given me good things, shouldn't I uh, serve him? And so down in verse 8, he says, Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name like uh, like the names of the great men who are on the earth. I will also appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again, nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly, even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Uh, so David is concerned about the temporary nature of the tabernacle, that it is a nomadic place for God to dwell in. God's response is, one, I never commanded you to give me anything else, so don't worry about it. Two, let me pivot that to say, what I'm going to do for Israel is what I've already done for you, David. David, I took you from out in the field and, and, and wandering around in the fields as a shepherd to now, where are you? I've planted you in a home. I've made you ruler over a nation and you are sturdy and have rest from your enemies. And I will do that for the nation of Israel, for my people. I will take them, and I will plant them so that they are no longer disturbed. Now, when he says that he's going to plant them, this is not, I'm going to move them to a different location where they currently are, because where they are is already the promised land, right? But as long as you look at the history of Israel in the promised land, there has been a constant lack of stability for them, uh, really basically after that first generation that conquered the land, so, which is really the second generation because the first generation died in the wilderness. So the second generation that comes in, conquers the land, they have some stability, but pretty much after that, you pivot right from the book of Joshua right into the book of Judges next, right? And Judges is all about instability. Right? They've got enemies all the time. They're constantly up and down. There's always problems. Um, God delivers them from those things, but there seems to be a pretty regular affliction. And so now the promise that God says uh, is that I will plant you and I will cut off your enemies and, and there will be peace uh, for the nation. Now that peace for the nation is going to come through David. David does not eventually build 
God will tell David, you're not going to build the temple. The guy who's going to build it is your son, who at this time has not even shown up on the, in the picture, right? But who's that going to be? It's going to be Solomon, whose name means peace. David is a warrior king. In fact, that will be one of the reasons cited that God doesn't want him to be the one to build the temple is that he has expanded the kingdom with much blood. There has, he, has, he has fought. Solomon, on the other hand, will be a king of, of peace. Um, and so, uh, David, uh, your house will be established, but it will be in my timeline, not yours. One of the great lessons, I think, of 2 Samuel 7 is that God is, God is unexpected. He is not what you picture in your mind. The things that he wants, probably not the same things that you think he wants. Right? In the same way that we see this with Jesus when he comes down here on earth, a classic example of that with Jesus is, if you were God and were to come down on earth, would you have chosen to join a poor family from Nazareth and be with that family? Probably not. Um, if you were in Jesus' shoes and you were standing in the temple and watching people put money into the treasury, would you be as impressed with the widow who put in two mites as Jesus was? Probably not. Because typically, we are impressed by things that don't impress God. And uh, we're uh, also disturbed by things that sometimes don't disturb God. That's another interesting aspect of life, is there's sometimes there's things that really upset us, and we go, why, God, why? Why does it have to be this way? And he's perfectly happy to let it stay that way for a lot longer than you feel comfortable. But in the unexpected nature of God is, one, David has this great plan to make God happy. And God says, well, I'm not really unhappy with the tabernacle. I didn't tell anybody to build me anything different. But I do appreciate your sentiment, and I will establish your house. So David, David's plan is to establish God's house, but what does God do? He flips it, and he establishes David's house instead. One of the things that you see throughout the life of David is every time David puts God first, God puts David first. It just happens over and over and over again. The times where David forgets to put God first, God knocks him down a few. It's a pretty steady pattern throughout the text. So as you look at 2 Samuel 7, this is a, a great example of it. David's desire is to put God first. Is he right about what God wants? No. That, God is not as concerned about the tabernacle thing as David is. But the sentiment matters a lot to God, and God... Because David has a heart to do that, God will establish him uh, because of it. Um, anybody have any comments or questions? Okay, so then, then we move down to verse uh, 12. When your days are complete, so when, when David's days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you. That descendant is not mentioned yet, but we know it to be Solomon. Who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. And when he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever, in accordance with all these words and all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. And we're going to talk more about that prophecy about the house of David because there's a dual prophecy there, and we want to talk about dual prophecies a little bit because this is probably the, the, the quintessential dual prophecy of the Bible. But one, this prophecy is about the establishment of the house of David. What David has seen with Saul was a king's lineage is not guaranteed. Right, Saul, he's king, and according to the, the rights and passages of men, then his son should have been king after him, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth, except that doesn't happen. He's taken out. But he's not taken out the way it happens in the kingdoms of men, typically. If, 
if the, if the house of one monarchy disappears and is taken out and replaced by another monarchy, typically the way that happens is second monarchy killed those guys, right? There's some sort of rebellion, some sort of war, and, and they're wiped out that way. That's not what happens with Saul, though. And the reason it doesn't happen is because of David. David is the guy who has the chance to kill Saul over and over and over again. And as you went through 1 Samuel, what's David's answer every single time? I can't kill God's anointed. God chose him to be king. I'm not going to take him out. Even if he's in the cave with me and I've got him in a very compromising position, uh, I'm not going to do it. So David refuses to follow the kingdoms of men and take Saul out. So if Saul is God's anointed, who does David give credit for taking him out eventually? If God had put him in, it's God took him out, right? And what he's learned about God is once God makes a king, there is not a guarantee that his son and his son and his son and his son will get to be king next. That's not how God works. What God cares about is the character of a man. David saw that firsthand. But now we have a promise being made to David that, David, your house I will establish so that your son, his son, his son, his son will sit on that throne and reign over the kingdom. When you get to uh, Chronicles and, and Kings, which chronicle out the lives of the kings, and I just picked out one of them in 2 Chronicles 21.7, but it shows up multiple times that the southern kingdom, that is Judah, which has a Davidic king on the throne, those guys, some of them are really, really bad, awful, and yet God will not wipe them out, and the answer is, yet the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David and since he had promised to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. So God makes this promise to David, I'm going to establish your house so that even after you're gone, that Davidic kingdom will continue. And in Chronicles, and again, this is one verse, you can, you can look that up on your own, a lamp, just you can probably do a word search for lamp and David or lamp for David's sake, and it'll show up uh, uh, probably about half a dozen times where there's a wicked king and God doesn't wipe out the monarchy because of a lamp for David's sake. And so a lamp, you think of it as it's a light. Well, ultimately, you get to the New Testament, who's the light of the world? Jesus shows up as the real eternal flame. And he comes through that lamp that stays lit for generation and generation and generation and generation. This is a messianic promise. And ultimately, Jesus' throne is not here on earth. It's in heaven. But what, what David would have heard is not Jesus is going to come in the first century. <laughs> the Son of God, the Emmanuel, will come and... Uh, uh, and, and he's going to die for people's sins and set up a, a kingdom that will never be destroyed. That is probably not what David heard. What David heard is, my son's going to sit on the throne, and my grandson's going to sit on the throne, and my great-grandson's going to sit on the throne, and God is going to establish this kingdom in a way that Saul's didn't. And that alone is a massive promise. And, and by the time we get down to verse 18, we'll see how David reacts to that. Uh, any comments or questions or thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, excellent point. I, the, the whole, uh, hey, we assassinated your enemy. Like, they, he's having none of that. Yeah, so he is very serious about, I don't make that call of who establishes a kingdom. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, so now I want you to go back, and we're going to look at this prophecy again, but I want you to understand that it's a dual prophecy. And 
a dual prophecy is a prophecy that's talking about something here and also something further down that's typically far greater. Um, if you get down to verse 14 of chapter 7, part of the prophecy is about this son, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. Now, that's true of Solomon. It's absolutely 100% true of Solomon. But in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, that verse is quoted to talk about Jesus. So this is a clearly, the New Testament tells us, oh, by the way, that prophecy about Solomon wasn't just about Solomon. And, and that shouldn't surprise us because as we as Christians look at the house of David and God dwelling with each of the descendants of David, we understand what's the end result of that? What's the goal? Is it to establish that physical Israel forever? No, it has nothing to do with that. It has to, to do with bringing in the Christ. So we understand there's a bigger picture. But if you look at this prophecy, I like to think of it like, like this picture of looking through a lens. If you look through a lens, you are, you, you are looking at the lens, but you're also looking at the thing on the other side too, right? The, the, the lens is this, this image that's close up that, that you also get to see this thing further away. Solomon is the close-up view here. He's, the, he's the, the, the direct prophecy you might think of, the, the most immediate um, subject of this prophecy. David's going to have a son. God's going to give him peace on every side. And he will establish his kingdom, and that son will build him a temple. That is all true of Solomon. But now magnify that out further. There will come a son of the lineage of David. And he'll be a son to God too. Could that apply to Jesus? Hebrews 1 5 says it does, right? And he will be a son of peace and will bring peace on earth. Does that apply to Jesus? And much more than Solomon, doesn't it? A greater version of it. And he'll establish a kingdom. And God will be with that kingdom forever. More so than Solomon. It's an expanded version of that. And so, what you end up seeing is sometimes in the Bible, God will give a prophecy and the people who immediately are receiving that prophecy typically probably are only aware of the most immediate application of it. I, I, I don't know for sure, but I suspect David does not have a full picture of, of how this is going to be a, a big messianic thing down the road. He may have gotten more inklings as time went on, um, but he would have understood the idea of, I'm going to have a kid, and that kid will have peace, and then he's going to build the temple, and God will be with him. But as you progress down through time, you see that what God said had a lot more weight to it than that. Think about it the same way. You know how there are things that grandparents say? Like, have you ever sat down with a grandparent when you're like a little kid, I had a great grandfather who I would go over to his house and it smelled like beets. And, and, and that was one of my earliest memories is that it smelled like beets. Um, but I would sit at his house and he would say things, not much, he was not a talkative man, but every once in a while he would say something. And at the time I would go, well, I guess that makes sense. But then you think as you get older, he said this really profound kind of proverbial thing that had a much broader application than what I first thought, right? Um, and so, you know, it's, it's even like in woodworking. You know, one of the first things that they'll tell you is, you know, measure twice, cut once. That's true in woodworking. Is it true in some broader things too? Yeah, you can apply it broader. Think of dual prophecies kind of like that. God's saying something and they could get it. Okay, we're talking about the kingdom right here. Oh no, there's a lot more going on than I realized. That's, that's the nature of a dual problem. Anybody have any questions or comments or thoughts on, on that? Yeah.
Yeah, I would agree with you. I, I, I'm not really saying it well in that I, I don't think he understood specifics, but I think David did understand something big just happened. This was not just a, um, you're going to have a couple of kids who will sit on the throne. This was, has a monumental impact, but not to the degree that he could see clearly. Is that fair to say? Um, uh, but yes, I, I, I mean, when you get down to verse 18, the, the next thing you see after David receives this is David the king went in and he sat before the Lord. And, and I, don't, I don't know how that scene actually looks, but I imagine it just being David just going in, you know, wherever he was allowed to be um, uh, near, the, near the ark at whatever distance that was allowed and just, just sits there somewhat rocked by the promises given to him. And he says, who am I, O Lord? And what is my house that you brought me this far? And yet this was, uh, this was insignificant in your eyes, O Lord God, for you have spoken also the house of your servant concerning the distant future. And this is the custom of man, O Lord God. Um, Matt, what did you say your translation said on that? Because it's a tricky passage, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, so what Matt and I are talking about a little bit here is is right at the very end of it. He says, and this is my trend. I'm reading New American Standard, and this is the custom of a man, O Lord God. And that is a tricky sentence, which is translated, <laughs> I mean, a, a bunch of different ways. Some very poorly, um, but. The sense is something along the lines of, um, God, are you working in the lives of men? Are you changing things down here? Are you affecting the, the customs or the charters or the ways of men? Um, and, and, and that's what Matt's kind of referring to, I think, and, and correct me if I'm saying it wrong, but is this sense of David going, God is working something down here that normally is the world of men, but God's reaching down to be a part of it. Is that a fair way that you would put that? Correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know how my house fits into that working in this, but it, you're doing something and you put my name in that in that charter, I like that language that you use there. It's, it's as if, you know, God is writing something down and making a promise that will affect the, the lives of human beings. And, and within that is the phrase, the house of David. I mean, that's a, that's a wild thought, right? Can you imagine if God, all of a sudden you found out from God that he had a plan for something he was going to do that would impact the world, and in that plan was your name somewhere? That's, that's what David is reacting to. Um, and so, uh, down verse 20, again, what more da can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Lord God. For the sake of your word and according to your own heart, you have done all this greatness to let your servant know. For this reason you are great, O Lord God. For there is none like you, and there is no God beside you, according to all that we have heard uh, with our ears. And what one nation on the earth is like your people Israel? whom God went to redeem for himself as a people to make a name for himself, to do a great thing for you and awesome things for your land before your people whom you have redeemed for yourself from Egypt, from nations and their gods. For you have established for yourself your people Israel as your own people forever, and you, O Lord, have become their God. Now before we you know, go any further, I, what, what I want you to understand is a couple of different things. One, David at this point is, this is prayer. This is him reflecting on what has been told to him and he is in awe that God would involve him in his plan and would, would make promises to establish David's house. And the other thing I want you to see is, how many times does he reference you or your, meaning God, versus David talking about himself? This, 
this prayer is almost entirely, you, God, this. You have established us. You have built up your people. You have uh, redeemed us. It is overwhelmingly focused on what God has done for David and God has done for Israel. And that mentality of David, this is arguably the pinnacle of, of David's uh, faith in God and, and, and spiritual health. We're going to see some downsides soon, and I know, you know, by the time you get to chapter 11, it's rough. But this is David in his finest, recognizing God is the one who establishes kingdoms. God is the one who does things. God is the one we should be grateful to. And I would argue that if we really want to live our, our best life, and, and by best life, I don't mean like Tony Robbins says it, you know. I, I mean like the, the life God intends you to live, the kind of person you are intended to be. The more you can think about him and the less you can think about you, the better off you're going to be. Because what we tend to do is to make everything about us and David is doing the exact opposite. He, is, he says, who am I? You are the one that's great. And that pattern is, is something that you see David do over and over again in his finest moments. Um, any comments or questions? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's almost like the same guy wrote him. <laughs> right, yeah. No, it is. I mean, the way that David prays is the way that the Psalms write. And that's important for us to know too, right, is that a lot of the Psalms of David, they are a prayer. And, well, it, in just a minute here, we're going to pop over to Psalm 60, and it's going to be a very different kind of prayer than this. But that, that uh, way that David interacts with God, we get to see that, and it, it's just really beautiful. Um, okay. And so uh, uh, he, uh, let's go down to verse 28. Now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are truth, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. Now, therefore, may it please you to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord, and with your blessing, may the house of your servant be blessed forever. Notice again, even when he's referring to himself, what does he call himself? Your servant, right? That, that is throughout this. And the other thing that I think is interesting is David knows at this point in his life what it's like to God, have God make him a promise. Because remember, Samuel anointed him to be king a long time ago. How long did it take for that to play out? So here, yeah, years. So here, when he's given this unbelievable promise that will go beyond his, his own lifetime, he simply says, your words are truth. He accepts it as if it has already happened, and that, folks, is also faith. When God says something, if you just accept it as if it already happened, you are really starting to get to the point where faith is where it should be. Because when God says something, it might as well have already happened. Right? If he makes a promise, it doesn't matter if it doesn't happen for 10,000 years. You know it will happen. You know it will come to pass. Um, okay. Um, so, then we move to chapter 8, and in chapter 8, we'll go fairly quickly. We're not going to read through every single one of these battles, but in chapter 8, uh, as well as uh, in, in chapter 10, there is uh, a lot of war. And as I mentioned, uh, Solomon himself will, will say that one of the reasons that Solomon builds the temple instead of David is because David was a man of war and there was blood on his hands. God uses David in a warrior um, way. That, that, sometimes I think we, we get in our mind um, that David wasn't allowed to build the temple because there was blood on his hands as if that was a sinful thing. That's not what's being said there because who gives David the victory in all of these battles? God, right? So this is not bad, but you use certain types of people in certain types of roles. And God wants his temple to be associated with an era and a king of peace, which matches what do we look to now? Who is our king now? He is the prince of peace, right? And, uh, and 
he is also the one who says, who, he lives by the sword, dies by the sword. So David, David at times is a type of Jesus, but at other times he's not. And this is one of those where God says, nope, Solomon uh, uh, is going to do that. So in chapter 8, there is this great list of all of these different battles. And, and again, we're not going to go through all of them, but when you get down to verse 11, It'll mention something from one of the battles. King David uh, also dedicated these to the Lord, the, the plunder from one of the battles, with the silver and the gold that he had dedicated from all the nations which he had subdued. Uh, and so, one, we find that as David is winning these battles, he's accruing plunder, and he takes a lot of that wealth and dedicates it to the Lord. Now, you can go and see in other places, guess what? All of that wealth, that bronze, that silver, that gold, all those things, those end up being used by Solomon to build the temple. So David doesn't build it, but he prepares for the building of it. Um, a great example of, uh, I think, positive parenting in uh, David's life. There's a lot of negative examples of David parenting, but this is a good one. Like, he knows his son's going to have a job that his son has to do and he can't, but I can give him the best beginning. And so he, he'll do that. Um, the other thing is, there will be a mention of all of these different battles in here. And if you just read chapter 8, it's like David goes to battle, David wins. David goes to battle, David wins. David goes to battle, and again, David wins. But one of these um, specifically that is mentioned is that uh, in verse 13, David made a name for himself when he returned from killing 18,000 Arameans in the Valley of Salt. Turn over to Psalm 60. Psalm 60, the context of this, uh, uh, which granted these, uh, those little top notes that tell you who wrote it and when, those are not scripture, but they are so old that really they're not disputed. Um, the context of this is, this was written, a mictum of David to teach when he struggled with Aram Naharam and with Aram Zobah, and Joab returned and smote 12,000 of Edom in the Valley of Salt. This is written during the middle of these battles. So, if you read chapter 8, it's like, man, David goes to war, wins, wins, wins. Piece of cake, piece of cake, piece of cake. But read Psalm 60. Oh God, you have rejected us. You have broken us. You have been angry. Oh, restore us. You've made the land quake. You've split it open. Heal its breaches for its totters. You have made your people experience hardship. You've given us wine to drink that makes us stagger. You've given a banner to those who fear you that it may be displayed because of the truth, that your beloved may be delivered. Save with your right hand and answer us. That psalm doesn't sound like the battle was easy, does it? Understand that we're reading this history of David going to war, and we see the end, he wins, but the context is those wars were hard, and he had to rely on God every single time. Okay, so we'll shut down there. We'll pick up. Uh, over, uh, we'll, we'll quickly look at, at uh, some things in chapter 9, but then we'll move over to chapter 11 next week.